hard. All right. I'm glad that, that worked. <laughs> <laughs> Little do the people who are watching know that uh, we try this a few times today and it worked beautifully. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's what happens, right? When, when you actually uh, need it to work, it doesn't. But here we are. All right. I'm going to pin this to the top and then uh, we could get started. There we go. All right. Sherry, one of our board members has joined. Thank you, Sherry. Hi, Sherry. Uh, and, oops. And uh, I don't know what Dr. Kiever is on, too. All right. So, since we're starting a few seconds late. Um, Hi, Charles in Panama. Charles McKeever, Dr. Charles McKeever in Panama. He's a friend. Oh, very good. And our uh, my friend from Poland is also tuning in. She's it's it's all it's one thirty in the morning there. So wow, <laughs> uh, she just waited up for you. It has nothing to do with the May Day holiday tomorrow. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for tuning in. We we typically have all these different uh, digital programs because of the situation we are in now, and uh, we decided to spin things around a little bit and have a uh, an only Instagram live uh, segment. And, uh, and when I approached uh, John Casey, because he's a very avid user as an author, he's been using Instagram and he jumped right at it. So um, thanks for joining us, John. And we'll get we'll get to him in just a few seconds. I do want to say a few things about him. Uh, not his full bio. Uh, but you can find us full bio at uh, johnjcasey.com, uh, among other things. But he's from New Hampshire. He graduated from the U.S. Air Force Academy and Florida State University. And uh, he is a veteran combat airlift and test pilot and worked for 10 years <clears throat> as a diplomat and international affairs strategist in Europe, Africa, and at the Pentagon. Wow. Can't wait to hear about all this. Uh, his first book, right here, it's called Raw Thoughts. It's backwards for you all, but it's Raw Thoughts, which we'll talk about later, has been nominated for the National Book Award. Um, and some of the poetry from his book has been nominated for the, uh, pu for the Pushcart Prize. His first novel, Devolution, very amazing artwork in these, and we'll talk about this later, but just really cool, both of the books, uh, is a psychological spy thriller. We'll have to ask him if any of that has to do with his personal experience um, uh, living abroad and, and working abroad. And um, he was nominated for the 2020 um, IBPA Benjamin Franklin Award he serves not only on the board of the World Affairs Council, he's also on the board for RISE Recovery. He's currently the director of U.S. operations with Conduent. And um, again, if you need to look at his, all of this and to find out how you could get those books, which we'll get into later, please visit johnjcasey.com. Thanks for joining us, man. Yeah, no, glad to be here. Thank you very much, Armin. Um, I think... Uh, I just want to point out uh, what a great job Armin and the World Affairs Council has done during this time of, uh, of uh, you know, COVID-19 and, and the impact that it's had on, on uh, you know, social distancing. And he really uh, pulled the trigger on, on uh, uh, you know, some innovative and very successful uh, virtual programming, uh, which this is one of the smaller, uh, you know, <laughs> events that, that he has put out there, but uh, some really good events. And I, I suggest that, you know, if you are in the San Antonio area, or even if you're not, go check out uh, the World Affairs Council of San Antonio website for the events. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, you know, we can't, uh, the, the reason we're doing well is because we have people who are watching and who want the, the information out there, whether it's COVID-19 or U.S. diplomacy, uh, or some of the fun stuff. I say fun when we were we had uh, Tim Farrow on, uh, Tim Morrow on. I'm sorry with the zoo. Uh, you have some serious topics in there, but it was a, it was it's different. It's not your everyday 
international headlines uh, items. And so uh, people are very interested in it. And so, um, and, and we can't do it without our supporters who are watching now and our donors and our board of directors. So uh, thank you. How are you and your family doing with uh, the COVID-19? Any, has it changed you all? I'm sure it has personally and professionally. So I would say that, that, that I and my family have been kind of lucky. So I work remotely, which means uh, my commute is normally about 10 minutes. Um, and uh, the only reason it takes that long is I stop to get coffee on my way here. And I sit right where I'm sitting now and I start my day. Um, and I have meetings in the morning. Uh, most of those meetings are with people in India. And by the afternoon, uh, those meetings are pretty much over because everyone in India is asleep. And then I'm kind of left uh, in a quiet place to finish up the rest of my work. Um, my wife, Mary, uh, she also works primarily from home. She is a uh, master's, uh, social, master's level social worker. And uh, so she does do a little bit of travel just to uh, see patients and assess their needs. But then she comes home to do all the paperwork and make the phone calls and, and things that she needs to do. Um, so it wasn't so much of a, a change for us. Uh, from that perspective, um, I guess you could say the big change was for us, uh, because we both work from home, um, we really value the ability to get out of the house um, and go do things after we're done working. Um, and, uh, and so it was a little bit of a double whammy for us in that respect. Um, but we are you know, we're, we're blessed. We don't, uh, self-containment's been easy and we still have our jobs. And, um, you know, uh, the biggest um, transition was probably the homeschooling of, of our two kids, uh, one who is a senior getting ready to go to college and, and another, our daughter who's a junior. And how, how is that going out of curiosity? <laughs> so <laughs> I don't have any real comparison to make, although, I, you know, talk to other parents and it, I think it was a struggle for, in the, for the first couple of weeks, but the struggle was, I think, went hand in hand with the, the school districts trying to figure out how to do it right. And uh, once uh, they were able to nail that down pretty quick, I think, and, you know, after those first couple of weeks, it's gone pretty smoothly. Well, I could totally relate. I, I have two cats. And uh, so it's, it, uh, I'm actually using their room for my office. So they're, they're not too happy with me. We just had uh, uh, Olivia, who used, who used to work with us, join in, and also Bianca, who's on the Young Professionals Committee, who we'll actually talk to next week. Uh, she just joined in, and she's uh, she'll share her experience. But uh, what, you've got a fascinating resume, and, and uh, I know you don't you're very humble about it. But uh, I want to hit some of the key points that might be interesting to some people who are watching who are interested in international affairs, who are interested in careers probably, and also people who want to write. Uh, you, you've, and, and we're just putting that in just a few sentences, but um, tell us, uh, you know, what made you, what made you go into the Air Force and talk about that career and being a pilot and what that was like? Okay. All right. Um, so, I think it's probably best to start off with, you know, kind of describing how my mind works. Um, now it's a little bit different these days than it was, uh, you know, like back when I was in high school, when I first started my career, but you could say that I was years ago, uh, I was going 90 miles an hour all the time. And I was doing, I was doing my best, you know, to, to uh, to steer, right? It's, the faster you go, the harder it is to, to steer. But um, the fact is, when, you, when you're going real fast all the time, you tend to do this, and, and you end up going a lot farther than you need to to get to where you're going. Um, but when I was in seventh grade, uh, I decided that I was going to the Air Force Academy and that I wanted to be a pilot. And that's one, one decision, that I, one career decision, if you will, that I made um, where it was a straight line that there was nothing that was going to stop me from going. Uh, and I, and, and that's what I did. I ended up going to the air force Academy, uh, and becoming a pilot. Um, uh, but as you know, and as we'll discuss a little bit, um, 
I didn't stick with that for my entire military career. And, um, and, and you know, just getting into the way my mind works, I, I'm always, when, once I feel like I've accomplished something to, to, to a good, you know, so, so I feel like I've done it well. Mm. Uh, I look for something else. Got it, and, got it. Um, and so that's why, you know, pilot, diplomat, author, I mean, it's probably a little more eclectic than that even. Um, but we don't have enough time for everything else. <laughs> well, I think to, to finish off the, the pilot experience, I think people are dying to know, did you do all that Top Gun stuff and flying upside down and all that? or No, no, no. So you have different types of uh, aircraft, obviously, in, in the Air Force and in general aviation. And um, uh, in the Air Force, you have, uh, uh, you have fighter planes, you have bombers, you have... Um, airlift aircraft and so i was a, a tactical airlift pilot mm. and so uh in 1993 when i finished pilot training i actually did a detour uh to go get my master's degree at florida state university um but then after that i started flying tactical airlift flying c-130s and and so this this is what a c-130 looks like so the wingspan is cool. 132 feet, and uh, the length of the plane is about 100 feet. The propellers uh, are are 13 feet across. I know it's hard to picture that, but this is a, a pretty decent sized aircraft, and you do not want to fly it upside down because <laughs> <laughs> of cargo and all that stuff, right? Yeah. So tactical airlift, you have you have two different types of airlift. You have strategic airlift, and you have tactical airlift. Strategic airlift mm -hmm. are the much bigger planes like the C-5 and the C-17 uh, that can fly uh, for great distances, hauling immense amounts of cargo. Um, tactical airlift is meant for shorter uh, distances. Mm. And um, it also has the tactical mission, which is, for instance, airdropping uh, pallets and, and vehicles out of the back of the plane over a war zone. Um, you know, uh, paratroopers uh, and things like that. So the, the, the strategic airlifters, they'll do a little bit of that, but, uh, but that's all we do. Mm. And are those existing? Do they use them now? Are they? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, the C-130s, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, there, there are probably, I don't know, close to somewhere between 40 and 50 different variants of C-130s that have flown or are still flying. Um, it is the most prolific tactical airlift airframe in the world. There are more C-130s being flown by more countries than any other aircraft. Um, I flew, I, I never stopped to kind of count and figure it out, but I flew somewhere between 15 and 20 different variants of the C-130, the latest of which is the C-130J, which actually has curved propellers, uh, improved range, improved speed, you know, farther, higher, faster, better. Um, and, and that's a relatively new uh, airplane. And I, wow. I, I actually did the, some of the flight testing on that airplane. Wow. Someone actually gave a shout out to the plane. I, I, I missed the comment from who it came from, but they, uh, they said, yay, C-130. Yeah, so. <laughs> I see my sister just joined. Oh, yeah. very. <laughs> and where does she live? Uh, well, she she's jumped around quite a bit. She's been in Maine and in uh, uh, South Carolina, and I, I I can't remember where she moved to last, but she just moved recently. Wow, wow. Well, uh, why don't we get Virginia? Some... <laughs> Virginia. <laughs> I'm sorry, Gina. <laughs> Your sister. <laughs> What, uh, let's get into the meat of kind of, at least, at least when I read uh, your, 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 um, your experiences, um, there's a lot that happens after the Air Force and there, there are different countries and different missions. Uh, there's Ethiopia, there's Germany. Uh, you learn how to speak French, you learn how to speak German. Um, Run us through that portion of, of your time. Okay. All right. So, so there was the tactical airlift 
part of my um, career, uh, which really is, it's a global mission. So I went, you know, I spent a lot of time flying to different countries in different parts of the world, um, deployed several times, uh, uh, you know, spent a lot of time in the Middle East, uh, you know, flew combat into, uh, you know, Kosovo, Macedonia uh, during uh, operations, joint forge and, 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 and uh, joint guard. Um, by the way, shout out to Lauren Pilcher, um, who is an editor that uh, I have worked at, with on a future book that, uh, that I'm writing. Hi, Lauren. Uh, her father was one of my, uh, was one of my commanders uh, at one of my positions when I was a test pilot. So I want to say oh, that. very cool. <laughs> Got a wide net of people who are joining in. All right. Um, so I, I did that for a while. Um, all, all when I was uh, stationed with, with Mary at, uh, um, uh, in Abilene, Texas. And, uh, and then I got a, an email one day uh, from an obscure um, organization called Big Safari uh, asking if I would like to interview for a position to, uh, to do developmental testing. And, um, and so that, that immediately caught my attention. I'm like, okay, I've done tactical airlift. Um, you know, you know, being a test pilot sounds very interesting and very different. And, uh, and so I, I did that. Um, so we, we picked up and we moved to California and I was stationed at plant 42 in Palmdale, California, uh, with Mary, where our son was born, John. Uh, and that was a very different and very, uh, interesting, um, uh, job, especially because 9-11 had just happened. Um, and, and, you know, like my old unit back in Abilene, they were gearing up, they were going to Afghanistan, they were going to war. Uh, and here I was staying back in the U.S. in California to do testing, you know, and, um, and, and w what, what I found was that the nature of that job was to uh, rapidly, um, you know, build and test um, capabilities for aircraft that are in the field and get it out there in some cases within weeks so that they could begin using that new capability against the enemy. Um, and so that was actually very rewarding. And uh, one, of, one of the side projects, and believe me when I tell you, this was a side project at the time was, a, was a, 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 a drone called Predator. This was part of my test unit. It was, you know, like a small part. And, um, and you know, shortly after I got there, and there was a, a, a terrorist that was killed in a truck in Yemen. And, it, and this was all over the news in, uh, on CNN, okay? Um, and it, it came out that this Predator drone had launched a missile and killed this, this bad guy. And uh, almost immediately, Predator became a big deal. And Congress said, hey, if it's that easy to take out the bad guys with these drones, let's dump a bunch of money on it and, and into that program and, uh, and make it big, fast, and, and prove that capability. Uh, and so that's what happened. And so this little project that, that uh, we had going out in California suddenly blossomed wow. into, a, into what it is known to be today. And before I left, you know, uh, Reaper, um, the larger aircraft that General Atomic built after the original Predator, uh, was already flying and, and testing. And of course, that's been around for a while now. Um, we, we up and moved that whole unit uh, from Plant 42 in Palmdale, California, which is the high desert, right? This is where the, the streets have no names. This is where the, the, the uh, um, you know, the, uh, what are those trees? The Joshua trees. Joshua tree, yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a unique place. But we up and moved the whole unit to Waco, Texas. And uh, so we were there for two years. Uh, and then uh, I ended up going to the, to, to the Pentagon. And 
that was that was a departure that I almost didn't want to make because I had a there was a job up in um, up in Boston, which is where I'm from. I'm from New England, and um, there was a test job up there that I really wanted, but the Air Force said, no, 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 no. You you have a a master's degree in international affairs, and there's a position at the Pentagon uh, that needs to be filled, and so they sent me there, and so that's that was kind of the this was in 2005 and so we we drove out to virginia uh, got a house there and i started my job at the pentagon uh in the international affairs office for for wow years. and so that wow so came in handy your masters uh you know a lot of time a lot of times you hear that it, you don't really use it and here lo and behold that's they noticed that and they uh one of the reasons why you were taken on yeah and uh, at the time, you know, I, I didn't really want to, to, to take that position, but I, I was glad that I did afterwards um, because it's, it led me down a different path that I found to be very rewarding um, and, um, you know, uh, experiences that, uh, you know, I, were almost incompar you know, I, I wouldn't have been, wouldn't have been able to have the experiences that I had um, had I gone to Boston instead. So. Mm. And and so uh uh before before going into your missions uh life in the Pentagon how was was that how was that experience So uh I had three different positions while I was at the Pentagon I was there for 5 years which is a long time Um you know normally you go there for 3 years sometimes 4 uh, the fifth year, I was really in in training, actually, for for the Defense Intelligence Agency position in Berlin. But um, the three positions that I had, the first one was uh, very much a policy job. Um, so I was uh, working on improving programs for the Air Force in international affairs, specifically for our uh, military diplomats and uh, language uh, courses and things like that. Um, I, I sort of enjoyed it, um, but I, wa I, I really did want out. And so there's the policy side, and then there's the regional affairs side uh, of the of SAF IA, the Secretary of the Air Force International Affairs. And I really wanted to move over to regional affairs because I felt like you know my experience and my degree was not being wasted, but not being utilized as, as much as it could on the policy side. The problem is um, they, they didn't really allow crossover. Um, mm. So the only way that I could guarantee it was to volunteer to be the executive officer for the general that, that ran the organization. So I did that and, um, and uh, which which was really long hours. So when you're an executive officer um, at the Pentagon, you have to you have to be there before the boss gets there, and you have to stay until they leave. But I had three bosses. So we had a two-star general, a one-star general, and a senior executive service member, which is like a civilian general. And so on one particular day, one of them would come in real early and one would real, leave real late. And <laughs> so you have this constant, um, you know, situation where you're going to be working long hours for, for the duration. Um, but it was uh, definitely worth it. And uh, I, I did eventually get over to the regional side uh, where um, I was the desk officer for the countries of France and France and Spain and Turkey and some other uh, some other countries, uh, and just in a nutshell, the desk officers would uh, basically be the portfolio managers for uh, the arms deals that the United States government was making with foreign governments with respect to uh, Air Force weaponry and aircraft, which includes you know, drones and missiles and bombs and aircraft and, and wow and all the training that goes with that. Um, and so you could say that that I was an international arms dealer, basically. Wow, it's like right out of uh, from uh, twenty four that that T 
TV series. Uh, is not, out of curiosity, what's that? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> was the out of curiosity? Was there a link? It sounds like some of the stuff is is intelligence gathering, or or helping out intelligence. Is there a lot of collaboration with intelligence? Okay, so so in that in that job. Uh, there is a lot of intelligence that's reviewed. Uh, some of it is confidential, some of it is secret, some of it is top secret. Um, and um, it's all quite important in the decisions that are made about which aircraft should go to which countries and with, you know, what, what kind of technology you should allow um, to certain countries based on um, their history of, of, you know, working well with NATO and with the United States and things like that. Um, but as far as intelligence gathering, that, uh, there, there's none of that going on in the Pentagon. <laughs> um, but but there, there is in, with respect to the Defense Intelligence Agency and the job that, that uh, I held after I left the Pentagon. Wow, wow. So uh, is, uh, is, is Ethiopia the, the bookend of your time as a diplomat or is, where does Ethiopia fit in? So Ethiopia was not an assignment per mm. se. It was a deployment um, and it was a diplomatic deployment, but not quite the same as uh, this agency. And uh, freezing up just a little bit there. Me? Yeah, you froze just for a few seconds. All right. So you're, I could hear you now. Okay. All right. Uh, so in Berlin, I was uh, working as an attache uh, for the Defense Intelligence Agency, which is a human intelligence uh, position. Um, and, but in Germany, um, what's unique about that country is that even though um, they are not considered five eyes, if you've ever heard that term. So five eyes is, is the United States, Canada, Great Britain, uh, Australia, and New Zealand. So those five countries really share a lot of intelligence, right? Mm. But Germany is like the sixth. Mm. They, they're like, they want in. Um, and, uh, and so they're very close to that. And so in that role uh, as an attache, a military attache in Berlin, which is one of the larger uh, embassies uh, in Europe, um, th there, was, there, there was a lot going on. Um, you know, at the time, Germany was uh, one of the major contributors to, uh, uh, you know, f providing force forces to uh, uh, Afghanistan. Um, so there was a regular flow of very high level personnel coming through and, and uh, uh, like General P Petraeus and uh, he came through twice while I was there uh, and uh, uh, Secretary of State Clinton. I've got a nice photograph of myself with Secretary of State Clinton. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was, e Ethiopia was, was different. I can talk about that in a minute, um, but I, interesting story about Chancellor Merkel, though. Mm. I did get to, to meet her briefly. Uh, and so on this particular day, I just happened to be uh, escorting about, gosh, I think it was 15 or 20 uh, Air Force lieutenant colonels um, who were, this was kind of their their road trip for Air War College, which is a like a master's level, a master's degree program that you go through uh, as an officer. And um, we were uh, actually in the chancellery getting a, t getting a tour and I was basically their guide and taking them to you know, different parts and things like that. And we're in the bathroom and uh, <laughs> one, of the, one of the lieutenant colonels, he, he looks at me and goes, hey, what, what happens if we run into Chancellor Merkel? And I looked at him, I said, well, you stop and you politely <laughs> say, Guten Tag, Chancellor Merkel. 
And so he's like, oh, okay. And we came out of the bathroom and ran right into Chancellor Merkel. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And I looked at him and I waited and he was just stunned. So I looked at her and I said, Guten Tag, Councilor Merkel. <laughs> and she looked at him and she said, Guten Tag. And then she moved on. <laughs> mm. Were those uh, were those experiences? I, I'm assuming they were pleasant. Secretary Clinton and Merkel and some others that you've met. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it, in Germany, um, because it's such a high level post, um, a, as a lieutenant colonel at the time, I'm actually kind of down here a little bit. Um, it, it, I would say Germany is one of those countries where you can go up one level, right? So uh, if we were in London, let's say, um, I would have to kind of coordinate and, and liaise with other, you know, English lieutenant colonels, right? Kind of stay at my level. In Germany, you could kind of go up one level, right? So Secretary Clinton, General Petraeus was a little too far for me to, you know, set up a meeting and have lunch, if you will. Um, so I, di I didn't really uh, have long discussions with him, but I did get to meet them. Um, wow. Well, and he's going to do the conference call for the World Affairs Council of America uh, yeah. next week. So yes. Um, yes. that's a great uh, that's a great plug. If uh, if you need to find that out, message me and I, I will be happy to send you a link uh, to him and also others. There are several, uh, Nina Ansari and, and several, uh, um, uh, Bill, um, the ambassador to Ukraine, Bill Taylor and, yeah. and, and several others. So, um, well, so, uh, so you're, you're, you've left Germany and then you had, um, and do you come back to the States or, or, oh, and so by the way, Kayla, I missed one of the messages. They said Kayla was watching too. Oh yeah, that's my daughter. <laughs> oh, yeah, she's, uh, she's here in the house. <laughs> uh, Roxana joined us. Uh, Wayne has joined us, and um, we're getting a lot of positive thumbs up and hello. So thank you all. So, um, all right. So where 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 were you off to after uh, you came back to the states, and then you? Yeah, so uh, a after Berlin, uh, I was assigned to Randolph Air Force Base right here in San Antonio uh, to another international affairs post, um, the Air Force Security Assistance Training Squadron, which is part of the uh, Air Education and Training Command International Affairs Directorate. Um, by the time I was finished there, I was the uh, assistant director and the director of operations. Um, th this particular uh, International Affairs Unit handles all of the training packages that the U.S. government sells to foreign air forces. So, you know, it, back in the Pentagon, I was selling aircraft, but someone has to teach those pilots how to fly those aircrafts and the maintainers how to maintain them and the logisticians how to keep the supply lines going. And so this unit here in San Antonio uh, basically manage those portfolio, those sales portfolios. And so I, I worked there until I uh, uh, retired in 2015. Uh, there was a five month period where um, I was deployed to Ethiopia, which, which we brought up a couple of times, uh, uh, where I worked at the US Embassy as a special liaison. And uh, in that position, um, at the time, so this was in 2013 and 2014, we actually had a military base in Ethiopia. It was a small base and uh, it was a predator base. Uh, it's no longer there, um, but the mission of that base was to provide surveillance uh, and reconnaissance for um, terrorist groups to find terrorists, basically. So we're talking about Al-Shabaab, Boko Haram, uh, the Lord's Resistance Army. Um, so the Horn of Africa, there, there's quite a bit of, uh, but those, are, those were the big three at the time. And so this, this base, that was their job to go out and find these bad guys, pass the information on so we could decide how to deal with it. Um, my job at the embassy was to grease the rails, so to speak, to make sure that those operations went unhindered. And mm. uh, what that meant was I had to, 
liaise directly with various parts of the Ethiopian government and with other governments close by when needed um, to make sure that, you know, things came through customs cleanly. Uh, when we had sensitive uh, people or items coming into the airport in Addis Ababa, uh, that they had the support that they needed uh, and things like that. Um, that was um, a, a very, very interesting job. Um, I was pretty much the only Air Force person at the embassy. Um, and so I was uh, asked to help out a lot whenever there were issues. If you remember at the time, there was a, an Ethiopian uh, uh, aircraft from Ethiopia Airlines that was hijacked. And mm. flew, what, basically, the, one of the pilots hijacked his own aircraft and flew it to Europe. Um, mm. And so I, I was involved in, in the, the, you know, the, this, the background discussion on how to deal with that as it was happening. Um, I also had the opportunity to, uh, to uh, receive and meet uh, former President George W. Bush and uh, Mrs. Bush, um, who, who came out there uh, to tour all of the ancient churches in Ethiopia. And so uh, I worked with uh, uh, a small team to plan his entire visit um, and helped coordinate the airlift. Uh, there were helicopters bringing them around and that was uh that was a lot of work but very interesting and very uh very neat to get to meet uh president bush mm, mm. and basically to ensure their safety and and handle logistics and um and and the helping the advanced team and all that stuff yeah yeah well i mean th there were a lot of things that were that they weren't thinking about you know when when uh, a, a former president flies into a field. And when I say a field, I'm not, I don't mean an airfield, I mean a field out in the middle of nowhere. And they're talking about re resupplying the, the helicopters with fuel from a 50 gallon drum that was placed there the night before. They don't know to think about things like, well, that fuel has to be tested mm. before they put it in the air. Because you can contaminate fuel to bring down an aircraft if you want, right? Um, you have to have guards there to guard the field, and um, you have to have uh, a good communications plan uh, to make sure, because when you have multiple aircraft trying to go into, you know, the same area, uh, you have to, have to communicate very well, and they were using civilian uh, companies to provide the airlift, so uh, it, was, uh, it was very interesting. Wow. Well, we have uh, 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 roughly about 10 more minutes or so. Um, yeah. Why don't we dive into some of the stuff that you're doing now? Uh, raw thoughts, uh, devolution. Sure. I mean, <laughs> uh, the next thing you're going to say is like you're a, you're a, a nationally renowned racquetball player or something. <laughs> I was wondering if I was going <laughs> to weave racquetball into it somehow. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you are, aren't you? Aren't you? Uh, don't they uh, um, sponsor you or something? Some some companies to play racquetball? Yeah, so I, I am sponsored by Gearbox, um, great company. Uh, they really support the sport um, at all levels, and uh, I've been sponsored with them for a few years now. Uh, and uh, um, I, I love playing racquetball. It's um, they're, I'm very lucky to have some very skilled a great group of skilled racquetball players here in San Antonio. And I can't wait for the gym to open back up. So I can go <laughs> but, Before uh, you get into the writing, there's a question here. Let me see if I could. Uh, it's by Bianca uh, about Mr. Casey's official into his official title. In, the, in Ethiopia. You saw that? Sorry about that. I think my phone. So I'm pretty sure I still have one of the business cards. I can't remember offhand, but uh, I'm not Atlas. sure. Yeah. Yeah, it was just the U.S. Embassy liaison. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> cool. That's cool. Well, so you you take all this and you're headed back to the. Well, no, uh, let me let me rewind a little bit, because I think you said that you started writing while you were living in in Africa, in Ethiopia. 
Yeah, so in, in a nutshell, um, at the time, I had an idea for a novel, and uh, it, I want, it was going to be a spy thriller. Um, I wanted it to be different. I didn't want to put uh, a, another cliche uh, spy thriller out there, right? Um, and so what I decided to do to make it different was um, to add that psychological aspect to it. Um, so basically, we have a main character. His name is Michael Dolan. And he's not really a spy, but he is brought in by the CIA because of former associations that make his involvement um, uh, important, if not necessary, to take down some terrorists in Europe that are targeting U.S. people and places. Um, and he has, uh, th there was a tra traumatic event in his past. Uh, when, when he was in uh, Paris uh, years ago, that kind of ties into th this psychological kind of downward spiral that he goes through after he accepts and he goes to Paris and he gets involved in this mission. As things kind of move along, things aren't going perfectly well, but he's able to kind of keep, keep it all together. But at the same time, he's having trouble dealing with um, various aspects of, of what's going on in the mission as it relates to what happened to what happened to him in, in his past. Um, and so that, that's kind of, uh, that kind of uh, is why I titled it devolution because that's not representative of what's happening in the book. That's representative of what's happening in his mind. In, in his mind. Wow. Well, yeah. This is it right here. Yeah. Um, and so what, if the reader's reading this, are they, are you are they thinking that will they be correct in saying that there's some similarities there or 70 30 60 40 similarities be between you what you've encountered and what you've experienced uh, and... okay so did i write myself into the book <laughs> <laughs> um so any good writer will tell you uh if if asked you know what to write about, to write about what you know. And um, so the first thing that I did when I started writing, uh, I, didn't, I didn't know anything about poetry and I started writing poetry. <laughs> and, um, you know, I square peg round hold it for a long time until I figured it out though and, and was fairly successful in that. But the whole reason I wrote Raw Thoughts in the first place, um, and by the way, uh, I have to give a shout out to Scott Hussey, who is the photographer for this book. Um, Amazing without, stuff in without here. Without his photographs, this book would be less than half of what it is. And um, I'm glad, also, I'm glad you put you put the picture of me in there too. <laughs> yeah, appreciate yeah, that, that. That is Roman K. Talk. He was the male male model for uh, that we used. Um, he also did the covers for, for Devolution and for the sequels, which these are hard to see because they're not very printed very well. But these are the covers for the sequels. So Scott Hussey uh, did those. So thank you, Scott. Um, but um, so write about what you know. And the, the whole reason I started writing Raw Thoughts was I, I, I didn't feel like I was writing, writing the depth of the characters in devolution as well as I should have. And so I put it aside and thought, hey, if I can teach myself to write really evocative and meaningful and um, uh, uh, emotional poetry, emotive poetry, then that will probably help me with the, uh, the, the, the depth of characters that I'm looking for. And, and so that project turned out to be a, like a four year project and turned into a book after which I came back to devolution. I said, well, I think I did it. It took four years, but I did it. Uh, and then uh, I finished devolution in the, in the same year. So I had 50 pages <laughs> that I wrote in Ethiopia, put it aside for five years. And then I wrote the other 260 pages in about nine. Wow. Months. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's phenomenal. While we're wrapping up, uh, if you guys have any questions, for John Casey, please uh, type them out. Um, I, I got to say, this is just, I got to know John 
because he was on the board of directors. And so we spent some time together talking about World Affairs Council. And then when I read this, uh, I just had a different, I, I didn't, the, the, I, I didn't expect to read the, the, the poems in here, what I had imagined in my head of what you would write. It's a very, uh, uh, in some cases, very dark, very thoughtful, very poignant, um, just fast, and they're complemented by these really amazing pictures. Um, I know we talked about having you, there's, a, there's one with, with just a few sentences. Do you mind reading that? No, not at all. Um, just to give you a taste of what it's like. Yeah, sure. And I'll just mention that, you know, with poetry, you know, the hardest thing is getting rid of all the words that you don't need. Um, and, um, you know, Lauren Pilcher will, will tell you that, you know, every, every word is paying rent. And so uh, <laughs> if, if it doesn't add something good to the poem, you take it out. So with poetry, you're trying to evoke a, a feeling or or get, provide value in a way uh, that it, w with the, the least amount of words as possible, right? And so this, I think, is a, is a good example of that. Um, I, this is one of my personal favorites. It's called, and this is one of the dark poems. It's only uh, eight lines long and it's called Stellar. Fleeting feelings cast in space, contrails of my soul drifting nowhere out of place, all as black as coal. Longing for a place to be, Earth, the moon, or Mars. Lost in the periphery, wishing on the stars. And so there's, there's that one. I, do we have time for one more? Sure, yeah. All right, so about the same length. And from the same part of the book, another dark one. Uh, this one is called Wondering If a foreboding poison sorrow has settled in my core. The irony, I cannot tell what I'm afraid of more, that I may learn what I dread most, insidious transpired, or never knowing, wondering if, unsound, beset, and tired. Wow. Wow, very nice. Raw thoughts. I got. A, I have a couple more questions while we're wrapping up. Uh, and let's see, fascinating segment. Thank you. Can't wait to get some of John's work. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Roxanne Ochoa. Um, two things. One, it, people who have inspired you, whether it's your writing or uh, your career, family. Can you? Are there some people that uh, you have looked up to, or you do look up to? You know, um, one of one of the you know, with respect to writing, it's it's kind of hard because I, I don't think that um, there. You know, Charles Bukowski is is a, an incredible poet, and reading Bukowski, I think, um, led me to understand that you don't have to write every poem like the two I just read. They don't have to rhyme with meter. Um, and, and so after I started reading Bukowski, that's when I um, started delving into, um, you know, poetry that didn't rhyme, that, you know, uh, was free form uh, poetry. Um, and you've written several for your, for your kids, right, in here? There's, there is at least one. Yeah, there's one that's without a doubt for my children. It's a longer poem. We probably don't have time to read it. But yeah, you write about what you know, right? Um, and I know my kids and how I feel about them. And, and, uh, and so it, it's hard to write about an emotion if you haven't felt it strongly, right? And so that's one of the other things that, uh, that I've learned. But as far as uh, you know, people who have influenced me and, and people that I look up to, um, I, there, there was one general, if I mentioned, uh, I already mentioned that uh, I worked in the front office at the Pentagon as an executive officer and the two-star general there who went on to be a three-star general, his name is, was General Ralph Jodas. Um, at his retirement, I really, I always really looked up to that guy. Um, at his retirement ceremony, uh, he 
he said something that has just stuck with me. And he said, real quick, uh, it's not enough to do the right thing. You have to do the right thing the right way. And then he gave examples of what he meant by that. And, but then he said, and, but it's still not good enough to do the right thing the right way. You have to do the right thing the right way for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. And that was poetry to me on several mm. levels. It's, it's saying so much in such a short span, you know, with so few words. Um, and, uh, and so I would say, you know, in my career, that would be the, you know, General uh, Ralph Jones would be the one person I would point to to say, that, you know, I really looked up to him as a mentor, as a leader, um, and as a man. Um, someone's curious what literature uh, you are reading, you're currently reading, if, if you're reading anything. Yeah. So I'll, I'll show you what I'm reading right now. <clears throat> uh, so right now I am reading a book by Carol Hines. Uh, it's called Someday Everything Will Make Sense. And Carol is... Uh, <laughs> Carol, this is a um, this is kind of a a, a a tragic a tragic comedy if there is such a thing. So there's you know there's some sad stuff that goes on in this book and you know death of a family member and but um, it's also kind of funny. Um, and Carol is uh, a fellow uh, Adelaide Books author. Adelaide Books is my uh, is my publisher, and uh, so this is a really good book. I I highly suggest that if if you get through raw thoughts and or uh, you know, devolution. Think about this available on uh, along with mine on Amazon Books, a Million Barnes and Noble. Uh, and then another Adelaide Books author, um, and I haven't started this one yet, but I'm I'm about to uh, by Elizabeth Gaffro, uh, Telling Sunny, uh, another great book, a novel. Um, this this is this is coming right after uh, this. So these these are the two books that I'm reading. Now. Nice, nice. Very quickly, I wanted to get the, the final question in. Uh, I know there's some young professionals who are watching. There's some people who have kids who are interested yeah. in, in, in serving or being a diplomat. I know you, you, know, you didn't really plan everything out. They, some things you worked hard for, some things uh, you were at the right place at the right time. Mm. What, what advice do you have for those who want to go and, and serve our country? All right, so it you know it really depends on it depends on a lot of things. If you want to join the military, um, and you and and you want to I don't know do what I did, let's say if you want to to be a pilot and, and to serve this country in that way, the best way to do that is to go to the Air Force Academy um, because they that is the one the one uh, uh, university or, or college in in the country that prepares you best to do just that right i mean that's the, the reason the air force academy is there uh, is in great part not in not completely but in great part to prepare our future uh leaders in the air force and and pilots um but uh you can also you can also join through rotc uh so which means you can go to a college like texas a&m where my son is going um and uh, he's going to be an engineer but uh they have ROTC programs, Reserve Officer Training Corps, uh, which means you uh, you get accepted to a college and then you join the ROTC, the Corps, um, and they train you while you're going to college to be an officer. And then at the end of mm. the years, um, you can then, uh, there are different options on how you can enter the service. And of course, there's the Naval Academy in Annapolis and West Point, uh, if, if you're looking for the Army and, and uh, the Navy. As far as um, as far as uh, being a diplomat, um, you know, the the State Department has a, it's a completely different career path, which I did not go through, right? But I did work with a lot of those folks. Um, I don't feel like I'm probably the best person to give advice on how to get go that direction. But you certainly wouldn't hurt yourself by getting a degree from George Washington University or 
one of these other American universities, some of these great, great colleges that a lot of these uh, future, dip, you know, future and current diplomats went to because that's what they're focused on, right? They're focused on international affairs and politics and, and things like that. And uh, get in touch with the State Department, uh, the website. Go, go there. It will tell you. Uh, there will be a step-by-step -step how to become a diplomat. John J.J. Casey, pilot, diplomat, author. We got raw thoughts. We have devolution. Thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate you for sharing your experiences. There's a lot, lot more there. And, and maybe we could bring you back to focus specifically uh, on some of the, uh, some of the areas, whether it's writing or diplomacy. Uh, John, John J. Casey.com is the website. Yeah. Be sure to click on that. And we want to thank you for tuning in. Uh, we need your, uh, not only your attention, we also need your donations and your support. So message us, go to our website. Uh, it's on our link. Uh, it's on, in, the, in the bio area where we have our link. You could find out how to do that. Um, and we're going to keep doing this. And so thank you for tuning in. Thank you all for your support. My board members, thank you for tuning in. And to everyone who uh, just uh, took part in this, we really appreciate it. JJ, you have a great time, great night with your family and, and kids. Yes, thank you so much, Aaron, and thanks for everyone for joining.